Welcome to our uh, seminar on uh, outs outsourcing repression, everyday state power in contemporary China. This is a discussion uh, with Lynette Ang on her new book that came out in May uh, by that title. Lynette is a political scientist, China and Asia specialist uh, who researches authoritarianism, uh, contention and development. She's a professor of political science at the University of Toronto, and she's also at the Musk School of Global Affairs and Public Policies Asian Institute at the University of Toronto. Uh, in addition to her latest book, she has also published on the broader Indo-Pacific region, including Southeast Asia and India. Her research interests lie at the intersection of authoritarianism, contentious politics, and development. Uh, she's delivered expert testimony before the U.S. Congress and the Canadian House of Commons. For her talk with us today, she's going to outline her findings uh, from a decade-long study on repression and state power in China that resulted in the book, Outsourcing Repression, Everyday State Power in Contemporary China. The book examines how the Chinese state engages non-state actors, from violent street gangsters to nonviolent grassroots uh, brokers. To, co to coerce and mobilize the masses for state pursuits while minimizing resistance. Uh, we're very happy to have Lynette with us today to talk about this important topic. So now I turn it over to Lynette. Welcome, Lynette. Thank you so much, Andy, for for hosting me. I'm very pleased to be to be doing doing this. Um, so outsourcing repression, um, everyday state power in contemporary China. So let me start with a quote from reading Lolita in Tehran. The worst crime committed by totalitarian mindsets is that they force their citizens, including their victims, to become complicit in their crimes, dancing with the jailer, participating in your own execution. Uh, that is an act of utmost brutality. The puzzle that the book ad addresses is, so we know that state repression usually invites backlash and resistance. So the question here is, how does a state balance coerced compliance on the one hand with minimizing backlash on the other hand, so that you get minimum trade-off between the two? The empirical context of this book is that we know China has achieved you know, tremendous urbanization, but the characteristics of, of urbanization in China, unlike that in a lot of developing countries, is that in China, it is very much a state-led process. The state expropriation of land, state directing people where to move is usually they seize their farmland and force people to move up to tall buildings, right? So urbanization urbanization rates has risen rapidly from about 40% in 90s to about 62% this year. In the process, uh, a lot of people have been displaced, millions of people, but there has been rather little resistance. There are some resistance, but there are actually pockets of resistance. There is no housing movement. There is no land movement that we have seen in other, in other developing countries, such as in India or in Brazil. So the empirical question is, how has the Chinese state been able to engineer massive urban transformation in such a short time frame with rather minimum resistance? And the solution that, that the book proposes is that because the, the state has been able to outsource repression and that outsourcing of repression has helped to augment everyday state power. And it outsources repression to two major types of non-state actors. Number one, violent thugs. And number two, nonviolent brokers. However, the characteristics of these nonviolent brokers are as portrayed in the book cover, right? That these individuals are faceless individuals. You can't find their names on Chinese papers. They could be anyone from the street. What the Chinese would, would say, any Zhang Shan Li Shi, uh, anonymous people. It could be anybody. So these stocks are, you know, people who are willing to sell their muscle power for, for a profit. Um, they are not organized into gangsters or, or mafia good. They are usually not organized uh, groups. And these brokers are grassroots individuals deeply embedded in the community that has lived in the community for many, many years and know the community members very well. So they are two major non-state actors who exercise everyday repression and mobilizing the masses, two mechanisms respectively, and that help in turns to augment everyday state power. 
uh, the book addresses three major types of three major bodies of literature. One is repression. I encourage the reader to think about to think about kind of the traditional literature on state uh, state repression. And actually, if we were to think about outsourcing repression, the state uh, outsources repression to proxies to people within the society. I think it really helps to broaden the scope of state repression uh, from the traditional military, paramilitary type of, rep of repression to societal uh, um, aspect. So if we carry that argument to its logical conclusion that the state can actually outsource repression to non-state proxies, state power has to be reconfigured. So the book also invites reader uh, to reimagine the contours of state power once we once we imagine that the state can actually outsource quite effectively repression to non-state actors. And the other body of literature that the book addresses is that of authoritarian control. So I talk about three main tools of control in the book, carrot, stick, and persuasion. And I think persuasion is like this new tool in the authoritarian toolkit that the state actually uses very frequently that is very effective and it comes with very minimum backlash or resistance. The book draws on three major empirical strategies. First is ethnographic research conducted annually from 2011 to 2019. Second set of uh, empirical strategy is my team built uh, an original event data set of land taking and demolition cases from 90s through to the late 2010s, and we have about more than 2,000 cases. The third strategy is content analysis of government policy documents. So these are these are documents issued by either central government or municipal government where I've conducted field research in. Uh, they issue policies and instruct how their local officials should be conducting land taking, how local officials should be conducting housing demolition. So if you like, this third empirical stra uh, strategy is an is input data. It articulates government intention, how they think they envisage things should be done, policies should be carried out. The first and the second strategies are output data. It tells you the outcome, given the input, how it is actually done. This is a map that tells you where I have done my field research from, from 2011. I started in Hefei, I moved to Beijing, then I moved to uh, more, inland, more inland provinces, uh, Kunming in 2012, Chengdu, you know, which I've been to many times, is a is a very pleasant city. I have you know friends there, and I enjoy going going there. It's also a very rich city in terms of demolition cases. I've also uh, done work in Zhengzhou, uh, which is you know in Hefei, in 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 Henan Province, in the middle of China, and then towards the end of my field research, I I spent time in Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Tianjin. So the square indicators, as you could see, uh uh, places where I have been and I've collected enough data to put together case studies in the book. The circle, the, cir the circle ones are cities where I have been, but I have not collected data for one reason or another. So there's no case studies, but I have got quotations uh, sprinkled throughout different parts of the book. So in schematic terms, this is how everyday state power is being practiced. So outsourcing repression is essentially a two-step process. So the, st so the state, number one, marshal a small group of society to become proxies. These are the known state brokers. And these proxies, in turn, help to repress or to mobilize society. And the important scope condition here is complic complicity of the proxies. Right. And this in turn gives rise to three different dimensions of state power. One is participation of the proxies, acquiescence of the larger society that they could buy with the participation. And on selected basis, you also have legitimation of state power. So the scope conditions are two main scope conditions, both, both of them 
could be attributed to complicity of proxies. So witting participation, that is a function of state strength over proxies or principal agent relationship. It's like you, you imagine you, you, you hire someone to clean, to clean your house, but the person may not be doing a perfect job. And, with, and whether or not you could control this person's behavior depending on your strength over that proxies and the relationship that you have with that person in principal agent terms. Second scope condition is unwitting participation. That is the proxies hold normative belief that they are actually contributing to the public good by doing the state's bidding, right? And that could arise due to ideological convictions, cultural myths, trust in government, or state information control. Otherwise, you know, so we can think about this as, you know, these proxies genuinely believe in the state doing and they are willingly participating uh, participating in the state's bidding out of normative beliefs. They believe that, you know, they, for instance, are contributing to public goods and services. So this is, this is akin to the idea of value-based uh, legitimacy that Margaret Levy has proposed. So who are these thugs? Thugs were hired. They are ruffians, hooligans, hoodlums, street gangsters, and sometimes legalized professionals who render violence as a for-profit service. They are usually the unemployed or people who just go out there to make trouble for, for a living. But these are also distinct from organized Italian mafias, distinct from Japanese Yakuza or the Russian violent entrepreneurs, which other people, other scholars have written on, largely because they are not organized and they are not disciplined. And they, they typically, when, when they work, when they carry out repression, they don't bear arms. Um, they are also not well trained. So if we would put them in terms of, you know, public versus private force and their capacity for violence, they actually fall into, the bottom right hand quadrant where they might be exercising private force versus the military and the police who exercise public force but by their capacity for violence because they are untrained individuals they do not have weapons are extremely low compared to other types of violent agents what are the benefits so these thugs for hire what i call thugs for hire they are perpetrators of illegal and illegitimate acts they are hired in order to meet local government's unfunded mandates. So since 94 uh, fiscal decentralization, local governments have to provide a lot of public goods and services to get a lot of things done, which they oftentimes do not have the resources for. And uh, when they're forced to do, to do things, they have to do it illegitimately and illegally. Um, people will not comply. And they will hire these uh, these uh, non-state actors, and their non-state identity in turn helps to offer a pretense of plausible deniability. So the deniability here is plausible because it is subject to certain conditions. But there are, there are of course costs for outsourcing violence. Um, number one, agency problem. These are untrained individuals. They are they might not exercise targeted violence, right? If they use excessive violence, they may in turn, you know, get local leaders into into trouble. And in my case studies, I illustrate how how those uh, when these conditions are not met, how local how local leaders would then be, have to be held accountable. And in some selected cases where you keep feeding these gangsters with jobs, and they become they grew to become very powerful, they might in turn in turn come back to to bite the state to usurp state power. That is especially when local authorities are fairly weak and doesn't enjoy a high degree of legitimacy to start with. Secondly, who are these grassroots brokers? You can imagine they are, uh, there's a high cost to mobilize each and every member of the society. So if the state could mobilize brokers to connect with the masses, they could actually save a lot of costs. So I divided these brokers into three different types, political brokers whose authority comes from the state, uh, social brokers whose power comes from the social capital they command, such as community volunteers and, and, and enthusiasts. Thirdly, economic brokers, their power comes from the capacity to, re to reduce information asymmetry that helps to match supply and demand. So think about them as, think about them as intermediaries, market brokers, that are go out there just to make a profit, right? And the way to think about them is, uh, for instance, uh, uh, ticket ticket scalpers, 
So if you want to go to a concert, uh, you can't get tickets. So these days in in Canada, at least I know that I have to go online to go ticket scalping. But ten years ago, uh, I have to arrive at the concert hall earlier, and as you you see these pe these suspicious looking people walking around with extra tickets. And if you're willing to buy, they are willing. They are going to sell you at extra, you know, fifty percent hiked up or even a hundred percent more than it was sold regularly. Where do these tickets come from? These people have access to to backdoor access to uh, the box office. Same with these economic brokers here. So they have connection with the demolition office, and with that, they could help their clients to bargain for extra compensation and that that compensation is then split 50 percent between the client and them and their share is then split with the demolition officers so everyone gets a cut no one really has an in, in has an incentive to blow the whistle but in the book my emphasis is actually on social brokers who are community volunteers and enthusiasts uh, who who uh, volunteer to do the state bidding um, so the political brokers are what we commonly heard of, are residence committee, village committees, the residence small groups, block captains, and so on. Social brokers are volunteers and, and village enthusiasts. So this, if you like, you know, this is, you know, in a sense, this is nothing new. This has, you know, Chinese society has always been this way. Uh, Liz Perry and, and, and Andy have written about, you know, what happened during the Maoist years. You have these people have been present, you know, throughout Chinese uh, society since the founding of the CCP. So what I'm suggesting that, you know, if this two layers of state and society, if we were to pull them apart, we can actually squeeze out this middle layer of brokerage. If we put them under the microscope, they actually play a fairly significant role in implementing state policies and helping state do its bidding. And this is by no means unique to China. In comparative politics, there's a huge literature in brokerage. Say in India and in Southeast Asia, uh, these brokers help ruling parties to mobilize votes, for instance, at a very grassroots uh, level. The way to think about them is in China, they are like the tentacles of a powerful octopus. They help the, op the octopus or the state to penetrate into society, deeply, you know, penetrate into society and grip society, right? Uh, without which uh, the state will have to do everything by itself. This is from my event data set. As you can see, you know, thugs, they are actually the third uh, most frequently deployed uh, violent agent just after government official state security. And these are the police and they are hired to do a bunch of uh, very carry out a lot of violent act. However, if we looked at uh, marginal effects of these agents, on nonviolent citizen responses. So thugs would occupy the first bar. So when, when thugs were sent compared to other agents, uh, their likelihood of provoking nonviolent uh, responses such as protest, petition, and legal mobilization is usually negative or marginally positive and, and very much uh, less responses uh, compared to when state security or other government officials were sent. Same thing with uh, with non with violent citizen responses. So when thugs were sent, they were less likely to provoke uh, violent citizen responses, such as harming agent, self harm, or damaging properties. Right. Um, so if you like, so those are the from the regression finding findings of everyday cases, everyday violence, everyday outsourcing violence. But there must be cases where these conditions are not met. When scope conditions are not met, what happened? What are the consequences? So I also conducted uh, some uh, thick case studies. And the way that I've selected my cases uh, 
um, I have committed selection bias. And that was purposefully done because I was interested in, in looking into the failed cases. So I look up the papers, I look up social media where there has been huge protests because of land grab, because of housing demolition, which happened you know, six months or 12 months ago. Then I went to the field and investigate the mechanism behind the failure and the consequences of the failure. So, you know, there's a bunch of agency problem in two of the, the cases. Uh, I looked at how local uh, leaders were punished because of excessive violence. And let me um, talk about this a little bit more. So this case happened in 2005 in Shanghai, uh, Xuhui district in the former French concession area one of the most expensive real estate in the, in the world. Uh, uh, real estate uh, developers wanted to take this land, but they couldn't, so they set arson, they, they set this place on, on fire in the middle of the night. Everyone has managed to escape as, except an elderly couple who were burned to death. So this is Shanghai, 2005, and got into a lot of bad press, and until today, the case hasn't been resolved yet. Uh, this case happened in Kunming in 2011. Um, also, excessive violence was used. There was a huge riots. Uh, and you see these elderly women sitting in front of the bulldozer in Chinese society. You have to respect the elderly. So they are using themselves as a shield to stop demolition from being carried out. And because of the riots and the excessive violence, uh, the, the land, the, the government did not successfully take the land either. So Kunming's, uh, I think there was party secretary or, or governor eventually got into trouble. He was, he was punished and taken from his position because he, he tried to do demolition on a massive scale and use a lot of violence uh, in the process. Um, same thing in Zhengzhou. Uh, I was there in, in, in mid 2010s, uh, tens of villages, this is Chengzhongchun, were demolished for the same reason, because they wanted to clear it and build, you know, high rise building where, where the government can, can sell the land off for a lot of money. There was massive demolition, there was violent land grabs. And eventually the governor in charge of Zhengzhou's demolition process uh, project was also taken away uh, put on trial and then punished and then vanished and then uh, expelled from the CCP. So there are actually obvious consequences, right? They are they are consequences when there is principal agent problem. Uh, this is how brokerage looks looks like. How schematically how three different types of brokerage works. Um, this is from my data set that I you know it talks about collective. Punishment, welfare, suspension, which you can think about it as uh, sticks. So when sticks were deployed, what are the rate of compliance? When thought work is deployed, which is persuasion is deployed, what is the rate of compliance? When, when rewards or financial rewards uh, were deployed, what are the rates of compliance? Carrots is very high, 70% of compliance, but thought work is, is even higher, close to 80%, right? And the fact that they are much higher than, than punishment is no surprise. But it's interesting that, you know, when persuasion or thought the work to is deployed, we, I think from my own reasoning, I think the Chinese citizens usually do not see it as a, as, as a form of state repression. Because the reasoning for doing thought work, right, the, and the consequences are usually social in nature, you'll be ostracized, you'll be, you'll be ostracized from your community. And uh, you wouldn't be able to, to be in, to be integrated, be part of the community anymore. And this sort of ostracization, I think is very important in Chinese context. And it the state can actually transform the relationship uh, from a conflict between state and society. But when they send a non-state brokers, someone who is deeply embedded within the community, like a volunteer or dama, to do xiang gongzuo, right? They can actually transform that into a societal, uh, societal to societal conflict, which I think helps to, ex to explain high compliance of thought, of thought work. So I, so I did a bunch of uh, um, case studies to illustrate how brokers uh, conduct uh, thought work or, or persuasion in harmonious demolition. Looked at uh, the case of Zigai Wei or self-governed renovation committee in Chengdu, 
where, where local authorities will first give some carrots to a bunch of people uh, to get them to sign papers. So I give them incentives. And these are usually consisting of political and social brokers, people with some social status within the community. And they, when once incentivized, these people will go out and mobilize the masses and convince the rest of the people uh, to sign. And the more they convince, the more carrots they will, they will be given. So it becomes a self-fulfilling self process. Uh, the state, after doing the first stage of the uh, outsourcing, they can actually wash their hands off, right? Whatever is done, all the mobilizing of masses is conducted by the society itself. If any conflict were to arise along this process, it's, it is also a societal to societal type of conflict. It has got nothing to do with the state. Mediation, I, I, I try to illustrate how mediation works, uh, drawing also on social capital and uh, community volunteers. I talk about the case of Huang Niu, which are these intermediaries or ticket scalpers like of, of profit-seeking uh, brokers in Shanghai and how they try to, to bring the two sides together uh, uh, into some sort of an agreement. Um, this looks at uh, temporal distribution of carrot sticks and persuasion. This is from content analysis of government policy documents. As you can see, rewards, the frequency of rewards have stayed almost the same throughout the period from 90s through to 2012. Uh, instances of punishment has actually declined. So this is government discouraging their local officials from using punishment to do to conduct land and housing demolition. However, the frequency of persuasion has in, has increased. Uh, this is uh, quite noteworthy. Uh, this is about temporal distribution of preemptive versus ex post measure. So. Interestingly, I think when we talk about repression in China, a lot of the repression is actually preemptive type of repression, right? Before people could go out there and, and organize collective action, before protest is, has manifested itself in physical terms, uh, a lot of prevention is being done before that steps happen. So, so, so um, a, lot, a lot of thugs for hire were deployed, persuasion especially was deployed in order to preempt uh, repression in order to preempt protest or collective action from taking place. And I think that is very much in line with government intention. Preemptive, the, the, the frequency of exposed uh, repression has, has, has not appeared since 2011, right? Since there's a change of legislation, but preemptive repression, the, free, the frequency has increased uh, in, the most recent uh, decades. Um, so very briefly, uh, chapter seven, it, then, you know, try to generalize uh, the arguments beyond China. I, I look at South Korea pre and post democratization in 1987. I think pre democratized South Korea uh, offers a very small similar case study to contemporary China because political conditions are are very similar and I'm happy to talk about it more in Q&A. India, on the other hand, is very interesting. I think it offers the most dissimilar case studies. You also have brokerage in India, but brokerage in India are very powerful. The state cannot actually mobilize them. They can actually turn around and bargain on behalf of the society with the state, right? So the relationship is very different. I also talk about Russia in different period. Post, uh, post 89 during the transition period uh, under Yeltsin where the state was very weak, mafias become very strong and the consequences of outsourcing violence to society when the mafias are actually very strong and state is weak. I also compared it briefly with, uh, with uh, Putin's years, at least early years when Putin, when the state was relatively strong. Um, Within China, concluding chapter, I looked at how outsourcing repression could be applied beyond urbanization, such as in the collection of illegal taxes and fees, implementation of one child policy fine. Um, I looked at uh, its implications for Xi Jinping's sweep, uh, sweeping black campaign, Xiao Hei Chu. Uh, um, if you look at the detailed case studies of how gangsters and mafias come about in, in, in China, right? Their first step, the long evolution process, the very first stage, they usually are hired agents of local governments, 
right? Local governments pay them to do a bunch of dirty jobs, including housing demolitions and land expropriation. And after that, they'll, it actually feeds into their criminal activities, then their criminal empire grew stronger. And it became such a threat that when, when Xi Jinping first came to power, along with anti-corruption campaign, he also wanted to get rid of these gangsters. And one of the targeted groups was those that are involved in land expropriation and housing demolition. So I see that as uh, part of the vindication of, of, of these findings of uh, pervasive, the prevalence of thugs were high and the threat they actually pose to the state. I also talk about implications for China's political future, and I end with a question mark about the future of field research in China. In, in, in a way, I feel, I feel extremely privileged to be able to do this work, uh, to be able to spend so much time in the field uh, over, the, over almost 10, 10 years. Um, and I think about, you know, uh, future of my research and how I should advise PhD students as they're trying to search for a topic and trying to collect data and to get, uh, you know, good research done. I'll leave it here. Thank you so much. I look forward to your, to your um, questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Lena. This is, this is fascinating. I, I have a couple of questions I'd like to pose to get get the discussion started. Uh, one question I have, I guess it's the the one that most people would have about this is why why would I can understand the, the initial use of persuasion and brokers that, that makes sense, but why why would local officials be reluctant to call out uh, the security services, which I assume are more than adequate to the task, but would rely on these um, informal puffs or thugs. Um, is it because um, that to call out the security services might signal to the upper levels that the local leaders are not handling things well and they might be evaluated poorly uh, for the next round of promotions? Uh, or is it the case that, uh, and we know this from some cases of urban clearance, that what's actually going on is illegal or is related to corruption on the part of officials, and so they don't want it to be reported. Um, do you have any, any any sense, I mean, what, what, what would be your core core argument about what is it that triggers the use of these, these figures as opposed to the formal security services? Sure, so by formal security service, you would mean the police, for instance, right? The police, the People's Armed Department of the sure. locality. Um, sure. Anyone. I mean, they got plenty of repressive forces in right. <laughs> grassroots. Right. So, so the jobs that these thugs were uh, deployed to are usually intimidation. Um, intimidation carried out, you know, late, late at night. Uh, not necessarily arrest or... or, or or repression of policing or repression of collective actions that the police usually do. So there is a bit of division of labor. You know, when big protests uh, breaks out, then the government might send in the police. But these are more preventive type of, of repression. So I think, number one, there's a division of labor. Number two, uh, these are dirty jobs. Uh, uh, those security, security service, those who wear uniform, uh, Cannot carry out, cannot legally and legitimately care, carry out these uh, these uh, illegitimate act. So thugs or hire in turn provide some sort of uh, plausible deniability. So if something goes wrong, it allows the government to shirk off responsibility. And number three, I think precisely because these acts are illegitimate and illegal, they cannot be caught red-handed. And that and that can. That has consequences for the society. If they get caught red-handed, they have to be held accountable to the people, but they might potentially be also be held accountable to the central government by the central government or, or, or higher authority, right? So the accountability goes both ways to the top as well as to the lower level of society. Uh, one of the interesting, this is a, uh, uh... This question is motivated by it, the result of your regression uh, analysis. And I noticed that um, you found that there was a bigger blowback to the use of the security forces than there was to the use of thugs. Can you, do you have a sense of why? I looked at that finding and I thought that's kind of, kind of counterintuitive. <laughs> do you have a sense of why that's the case? 
Um, I think there are a number of, of reasons. I think the, the most significant reason to me is when when the police is, is sent, this person legally and legitimately represent the state. So the police, when the police carry out violence, it comes from the state. It's a very clear sense of state repression. So, but when thugs are used, uh, they might know that it is associated with the government, with the state by extension somehow, but, but there's, no, there's no explicit association because these people do not wear uniform. And, and, uh, and the, the responses from the citizen is because all of that becomes relatively muted compared to, to state security, which is the police, and also in comparison with government officials. When, when government officials were sent to do the same actions as the thugs would do, such as intimidation, such as you know setting fire, arson, and things like that. You know it provokes a lot more uh, emotional reaction uh, when they see the when when they see government officials where you know their salaries come from the people doing same sort of uh, illegitimate act. Interesting. Yeah, that 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 makes sense. Um, let me actually uh, shift to a couple of my colleagues who've asked questions. Um, Jennifer Pan says she's wondering if you can uh, talk more about how the various repressive strategies are selected for deployment in different cases. Um, are are the uh, uh, thugs sometimes used alongside security or quasi security? Are they sometimes used alongside brokers? Uh, what's behind these decisions about what bundle of strategies to deploy? And I, I just add on top of that the question I had, was, which was. Is there a sequence that you see that goes from persuasion to the hire of uh, informal enforcers to the security services? Sure, that's a great, great question and a complex question in addition to yours, right? So let me unpack it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually do see temporal variation in, in terms of different types of strategies. Uh, so from violent in the earlier years, 90s, to increasingly nonviolent strategies, that is persuasion, right? Uh, there's also spatial variation. If you look across China, uh, inland areas and inland cities tend to be more violent compared to coastal cities at the, at the same time period. Uh, if you take one city and divide it into central business district CBD and outskirts of the city, say, you know, Sihuan, Wuhan, you know, outside the fourth and fifth ring road, those where Chengzhongchun populate tend to be very uh, violent, partly because their land is actually worth a lot of money and it's easier to, to dole out violent repression in those locality. But in the CBD, you know, the cost of using violence is very, very high. So we tend to see more persuasion and almost very unlikely that we will see violence. So, so at one point in time, what is the degree of substitutability between you know different types of repressive measures? Um, my sense is, and I and I don't have concrete data because you know I think this is extremely difficult to study. Uh, various measures are being used at the same time, and it depends on a, num a number of things in in land and land seizure cases and housing demolition. Local governments usually have to borrow money from banks and they owe money and with interest rates they have to be paying interest rates so they're under a, a lot of pressure to get things done right so they will use all sorts of measures and depending on how they work uh outsourcing violence is usually a lot more effective and efficient so they tend to use that when they're under a lot of pressure and persuasion usually you take six months a year a couple of years to make it really work because these these people have to knock on everyone's door and then trying to do persuasion back and forth knock 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 you know it would it would take a long time so if they got time in their hand when the cost of using violence is very high let's say in cbd in shanghai we tend to see more uh more uh persuasion and less violence thank you um uh, Nancy Chun has asked, um, media in China are very strictly controlled uh, and has the lack of free reporting contributed to repression? I guess uh, I would add on top of that question, are, and I think you, you all 
already implied this, that the more visible protest would be, if it's in the central business district, the harder it is to cover it up. So I would guess more remote regions might be more um, likely to use this kind of repression, informal repression of physical violence than areas closer to the central business district. Does that, does that make sense to you? Yes, yes, sure. And uh, media censorship has also, I think, might affect uh, the data or the findings in some ways. Uh, so I collected my data, you know, about f at least five, six years ago. And in the last five years, a lot of these human rights organization uh, has websites which I have been mining and scraping data from. They have all been booted out of China. And even those that are based in Hong Kong have shut down. Uh, so, so it has definitely uh, affected how protest and violence is being reported. Um, and I think that has uh, a lot of consequences in terms of selection bias that we see in, in repressive cases. But I think I was lucky enough to study the period where those, op those organizations were still operating. So, yeah, if you went back in time, uh, my, my recollection of the 1980s and maybe the early 1990s, but it was prim primarily 1980s, um, a lot of new uh, local newspapers were set up and a lot of young reporters uh, saw themselves as crusaders for um, uh, champion, championing ordinary people uh, for the abuse, right. over the abuse of power and corruption. And right. I saw, right. I personally saw examples of this just right. walking around Beijing with a reporter from Jinji Rabal. Um, right. and, it strikes me that that sort of thing has progressively disappeared over time. I don't know how far back your research goes, but yeah, I think no. So I, I think there's a trend no, sure. that, that really sure. shifts. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. Th th so uh, that is a very interesting point, Andy. So my my study did not cover the 80s because you know uh, mm -hmm. I don't have data from the 80s. But I, you might have noticed that in the last couple of years, because these human rights organizations have shut down, this news cannot come out. I see on Twitter a lot of Chinese people actually go directly to Western social media because right. they, they know that there's no intermediaries anymore. So somehow they have managed to figure out that you know, if I get access to a, to a VPN, I can actually broadcast it to the world without going through these people. So these people used to set up a hotline that if you have grievances, you call this hotline and they will make a report and then publicize it. But these organizations are gone. So these people then go directly online. So sometimes you see on Twitter saying that you know, in Chinese, my land has been grabbed. You know, please, you know, please help SOS. Yeah. I, I, I want to probe just a little bit. This is my question. I want to probe just a little bit about the relationship between the persuasion aspect and the, the thugs for hire. Um, it, is it possible that persuasion is made more effective by the foreknowledge that the next step might be thugs for hire? Uh, if, we, if we consider these as causally independent things, it might look like the system is more soft repression than would otherwise be the case. There's, a, 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 there's an article somewhere in the political science literature of bargaining in the shadow of something of repression or something and i think do you do you see that mechanism at work that is that is that is very interesting um i think it is it is possible it is possible um i'm not ruling it out at all however i think in usual in usual circumstances persuasion works uh because the state couldn't use violence and therefore they have to use non non violent means mm -hmm. um and the consequences of not of not complying with thought work uh the consequences are social not it has nothing to do with the state uh, usually they would come in and say that you know you have to sign these papers because uh you are the only family that that in this uh block that has not signed do you know that your non-action will affect a lot of people, including your next door neighbor who has a son who is waiting to get married uh, without, real, without an extra apartment that is coming from the government? You know, you are holding up people's uh, lives and then you will be ostracized. You know, that is the sort of logic that is usually given, drawing on social capital. Um, at the back of their mind, they know that they, are, they don't have much of an option and the, the, some of the consequences might involve you know, thugs. 
uh, who knows. And that's interesting because part of the persuasion then actually is leverage, applying leverage over people. Um, precisely, precisely. Very interesting. Let me ask um, something. It's sort of, I think, about scope conditions for your argument. Um, Arthur, Arthur Lieberman asks about, um, essentially about uh, Uyghurs in Xinjiang, and he, he poses it this way. It seems that um, your views of complicit support of repression requires some national or cultural connection to the government. Does this explain the suppression of the Uyghurs in its various forms, or is something very different going on there so far as we can tell? So I'm, I'm not an expert on Xinjiang at all. I would think people who carry out state repression in Xinjiang are not local Uyghurs. So if that is what you mean by, by second, second element, second condition of complicity, because you know, persuasion is usually implemented by people who are embedded within the society. And my understanding at least is that repression in, Xin, in Xinjiang are not carried out by Uyghurs on Uyghurs. It's conducted by Han Chinese imported from other parts of provinces on Uyghurs. If I am correct, uh, then you know, it is not the same. But, but you know, I don't know whether it's actually, whether the state has actually buy up the support of some Uyghurs to conduct repression on local Uyghurs. But that is, but that, that is essentially my, uh, my argument. Yeah, that's, it, that's a difficult question to answer based on, based on the research sites that you're looking at. Um, yeah. uh, a couple of people are interested in um, whether or not this is also these kinds of this, these kinds of relationships at the local level are also being used to uh, handle carry out the zero COVID policy. Absolutely, absolutely. I think the biggest application of uh, of uh, social brokers are zero COVID, at least at the beginning, because the state doesn't have the capacity, the man the manpower to implement zero COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's just not enough uh, neighborhood committees to do the job. There's not enough civil servant, which they also try to mobilize. So on a practical basis, they have to mobilize volunteers, which are usually, you know, these dama or uncles and even university students going back for a holiday and get stuck in Shanghai, get mobilized to take temperatures five times a day to conduct various, to administer various tests. But I think what is interesting with zero COVID is it also illustrate quite well the limitation of mobilizing volunteers, right? If you look at Sh Shanghai, there's a lot of resistance, right? Six months ago in Shanghai, because people got so fed up with it, because the measures went, went mm -hmm. overboard. You know, pe people were stopped going, were prevented from going to hospitals and to attend for, to illnesses because they cannot produce a certificate. Uh, so, so when People stop buying into it. I think the 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 mechanism of persuasion and mobilizing of social uh, brokers then would uh, that would actually fail. Um, one question I had: you actually had one slide uh, about international comparisons, and you went through that fairly fairly quickly. Um, I was going to ask before I saw that slide whether this is um, internationally unique or whether you saw any parallels and. Uh, yeah. You, you said there's a strong contrast with India, uh, yeah. but but I'm curious about the pre 1988 87. Yeah, sure. So period, not, you know, in South yeah. Korea, which was be under under military rule, basically. Sure. So not at all. So when I was in the field in China, I observed mm -hmm. this from 2011 to about 2014. I came back from the field thinking how I should turn this into academic research. Right. I mean, I was like looking for literature. Where do I, how do I frame this, and how and what hook should I, you know, pack it? Then I started reading about violence and what happened in 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 Russia. One thing led to another. There's actually a lot of literature on this in India, outsourcing of violence, and in Russia, outsourcing violence to mafia. Uh, it talks about in Yeltsin's year when the government was very weak. People like private businesses have to turn to mafias for enforcement of contracts because the state just didn't have the capacity to provide the rule of law. And in South Korea, pre-87, to clear the Seoul, the city of Seoul to clear land for the Asian games, they have to get rid of slum dwellers. Same thing, they're sending a lot of gangsters very little resistance because it was pre-democratization. And post-democratization, 
they couldn't send in gangsters anymore, not directly, but they hired security agents. These security companies then hired gangsters to do the same job. I see. Right. But by the time civil society has actually developed, so there's a huge housing movement that could organize people into you know groups and resist against the state. So that to me signals you know uh, you know some hope for China if there's some democratization, there's more civil society development one day in China. I don't think outsourcing violence would actually stop because that is so much more efficient, right? But we might see this in Taiwan, what they call piao bai. These people will bleach themselves into from black to white, and they'll do the same thing on a, on a legal basis. So one of, the, yeah. one, of, one of the differences you did point out was that um, you said that the thugs for hire really are not part of organized criminal gangs. They're not part of mafia. Um, but you just mentioned in South Korea or Russia, they, they were. I wonder, this is a methodological question, um, could they have been, but you had no way to find out? <laughs> um, uh, you could be right. Um, I have I have tried to search for criminal statistics, which are not readily available. Um, I have tried to look into case studies where where mafias get napped and, and they talk about their background. Mm -hmm. um, I think they are not usually, I'm not ruling it out. I mean, in Kunming, I do observe that they are part of, you know, bigger organized uh, group. But I think by and large, they are not because they are, these people are hired when, when the government needs a project to be carried out. Mm -hmm. And they are actually dismissed. So in, in a sense, they are dispensable after the project has completed. Uh, this is this is not mafia. It's a mafia groups are uh, permanent or if or if not semi permanent organizations, which you cannot get rid of, and there is a permanent relationship between them. You know, for instance, in the in the in in the Kuomintang period, right, um, where there is relationship be between Kuomintang and Green Gang in Shanghai. That sort of relationship is was ongoing and sustaining in to a certain extent that they mobilized the green gang to decimate the communists and the green gang, the mafias run businesses that KMT was forced to recognize. Right. So there's there's obvious, obviously sustaining collusive relationship going going on. But I think in contemporary China with these thugs were higher, these are not permanent organizations. Right. And and usually there's no sustaining relationship It's more on a project basis. I know you had some photos of some of these people, uh, at least the, the photos purported to be of, of thugs for hire. Have you been able to do much um, investigation of who actually these people are? You, you gave a brief description of them. I'm just curious. I assume it's very difficult, you know, like studying organized crime. It's it's a dangerous, a dangerous topic. Uh, to investigate to to actively, but do, do you have what kind of concrete sense do you are, are these just local unemployed people are they. Um, these are right so these are usually locally local unemployed people, but they are not from local villages, because they uh, are they are they are the consequences for beating up someone you know, I like see. your neighbors or your cousin so so they're usually from this county. They speak the dialect. They know the nice. neighborhood. They know the villages well. Uh, they know the in and outs of the village, but they cannot be from the locality as such, from neighboring places usually. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer Pond has a follow-up question um, on this conversation. Did any of the thugs for hire become more organized over time? Um, not sure if they become organized crime, but do they gain organizational capacity or Create. This is my my language, not hers. Do they become kind of a um, a small private enterprise uh, because they are thugs for hire? So maybe there's some continuity in the services that they offer that's somewhat analogous to what you saw in Russia in the 1990s. Yeah. So if you look into case studies that you know some criminologists and sociologists have written about. Um, uh, these mafia, how they get, how they become a mafia ring, right, mm -hmm. uh, and run multi-million type of uh, criminal em empire. 
uh, they have their beginning, like the 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 origin of their empire, how they started these businesses. Were they will get a few of the brothers, the shunti together, and do outsource dirty jobs for the government, uh, includes various things. In the eighties, it it could be collection of illegal taxes, right? Uh, implementation of one child policy fines, and then subsequently it evolved into uh, housing demolition, intimidating people, getting people to to grab to grab their land to sign papers, and then over time they get into more criminal activities, drugs, and other vices. But it starts somewhere. And outsourced tasks are usually where they start. And I think, you know, that is implicitly recognized in Xi Jinping's uh, Sao Hei Chu -e campaign. If you look at the 12 targeted groups of people, it actually goes from very well organized type of mafia uh, to somewhere in the middle. And these these uh, people who do who are involved in land demolition are at the very, very bottom of the rank. Well, thank you, Lynette. This has been a terrific uh, session. Unfortunately, the time's gone by very quickly. Um, our time is up. I think we have about 30 seconds before our Zoom session disappears. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, if you want to buy this book, it's available on Amazon. It's, I guess, just about everything is. So you can pursue this further in more detail. So again, thank you so much, Lynette. It was great to have you back with us, even if, once again, even, even though it's just virtually. Thank you for, for hosting me, Andy.